What's up, everybody? It's your main man, Spice Adams, and I am here in New York City filming Off The Grid Podcast. This time, we got Grammy Award-winning DJ and producer, DJ Premier. We're going to talk about DJ, and we're going to talk about hip-hop, and we're going to talk about everything music. Let's go. Yes, sir. I'm here with my guy, Grammy Award-winning. DJ and producer, DJ Premier. Yes, sir. What's up, baby? Yeah. Good. I'm bumping the mic already. Nah, but, it's so all if you good. hear a thud, that's <laughs> it. That, that, you, you saw it on camera. You know, so. <laughs> What's going on, man? Oh, man. Uh, slow motion, just staying focused on doing music all the time. Obviously, that's the biggest passion and my calling. So yeah. that's where I always focus on that. And Raising a 12-year-old at 57 years old. Woo-wee! <laughs> Man, I yeah. got 15, 13, uh-huh. 12, and 10, and it is a beast. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, I've I've got to come to your house to actually. Yeah, you seen, yes. you seen the crib. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's what he does. That's what he films at. Oh, that's the staircase. You know, so it, yeah. it, it was always dope just to, to experience how, how you transitioned from doing you know sports and, and and you know for two classic teams you know from the bears to the 49ers and then yeah. now like you were just so hilarious that I, it's like I, I i'm always like what is he gonna think of next you keep, <laughs> you keep coming up with funny stuff man and then you and crockett got together oh yeah man <laughs> was hey. that after the baby face teddy riley yeah yeah that's like one of the first things we did man he was baby face i was yeah. teddy riley Cry- on Crockett's dope, funny, man. Man. shout out to him too yeah hey that's my guy, man. That's that's what my up, big what brother, up, hey, man. What up, Crockett? <laughs> yeah. So how did you how did you get the name DJ Premier? Like, I'm pretty sure you want Premier your whole nah, career. My first name was well. First, I was DJ Chris. DJ Chris. Yeah, because okay. my name is Chris. Went with the generic joint, yeah, like me, DJ Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> DJ, yeah, exactly. DJ Steve. And stuff, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was. But then um, after there was Jam Master J and Grandmaster Flash and God bless uh, Jam Master J, rest in peace. We uh, I I I said no one's using wax like the vinyl. We we call it wax. Mm-hmm. So I said, how about Wax Master C? Yeah. I, that became my new name, and uh, shout to my first MC named Topski, uh, who went to college with me at Prairie View. Shout to PV HBCU. And, uh, this wasn't done on purpose. I just happened to get a, get a, a clean <laughs> hoodie out of the dryer. So, but uh, but yeah, um, Top used to just be like, "Yeah, yo, wax." That's how he's always talking. Yo, wax. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's where now, even to this day, even though I'm DJ Premier, whenever I talk to him, because we're still mm-hmm. friends, he'll be like, hey, yo, wax. You know, so, and, but he always, <laughs> and he's from Boston, like Guru is, yeah. recipes to him as well. He always still calls me wax. So, mm-hmm. um, but when I got my uh, demo heard at Wild Pitch Records, where Gangstar was already a group, the uh, owner of the label, Stu Fine, was like, I really don't like your name. He said, I think you could get a really? better one. And I'm like, yeah. But he was he was hating on your name. Yeah, though. he said, yeah, I don't like Waxmaster C. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because there was a Waxmaster Tory who actually happened to be on B Boy Records, which was KRS label from when Criminal Minded came out. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, there is another Waxmaster because at the time I didn't know. Boom. Um, he says, if you could come up with a better name, he said, let's let's see if we could do push for that. <clears throat> I was about to go back to college uh, after the Thanksgiving break. I told my mom about it. God bless her. She uh, she said, uh, make a list of like five to ten names. I mm-hmm. got a sheet of paper. My mother's an art teacher, so she always has something to write on or something to draw on. Mm-hmm. Started writing that names down. I remember I had a DJ Scratch and Cut. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, I, <laughs> you know. I, I'm glad I didn't go with that one. <laughs> uh, Premier was one of them. Um, what was another one? Platter, DJ Platter, because you know the platter spins on the record on the turntable. So mm-hmm. I just wanted things that 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 connected to DJs knowing this, the the terminology. As long as the DJ knew the slang, I wasn't worried about everybody else because DJs know what a platter is. We know what the platter <laughs> dots are. You know, we we know what scratching and cutting is. It's mm-hmm. not the same. You know, so uh, Premier was one of the names. My mom looked at the list and was like, 
I like premiere. She said, but take the E off the end. She said, because it's not like a world premiere with your E on the end. It's like your number one. And I was like, okay. I called Stu Fine and said, how about DJ premiere? He said, that's it. That's the one. And I stuck with it. Nice. All right. So the Wax master, but I'm still wax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still wax. <laughs> what up top. So, and, oh, and I got to shout out the other two members of my crew uh, back then. Mm -hmm. uh, Sugar Pop from Dallas, Texas. And Styly T, he was our flavor. Styly T. So <laughs> this is a group you had in Texas. Yeah, we were first. We were called MCs in Control, which I thought was a so dope you used name. to rhyme. No, I was the DJ. Okay, but, okay. Yeah, but, I was uh, about to say. Yeah, no, nah, I'm, I'm just good at reciting rhymes of other people. <laughs> you know, I know you probably got some bars stashed. Oh right now. man, I <laughs> always try to do some of everything, man. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Like I don't get embarrassed too much, so nah, if I spit man. something, I don't even really care about the reaction. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> <laughs> so, you are originally from Texas. Yes. A lot of people think you from, from New, New York. Born and raised. Yeah, my, my grandfather lived in Brooklyn, and that's how my first New York connection started, because every summer, mm -hmm. when, when we got out of school for the summer, every year since I was probably like seven years old, we have to go to South Carolina to visit my father's uh, the, uh, family. Mm -hmm. Then we drive to Raleigh, and we're just driving. Mm -hmm. We drive to Raleigh, North Carolina, to see my aunt, my aunt and my uncle and my cousin. Then we drive to Baltimore, where my mom was born and raised. And then we drive to New York as the finale, and we stay with my grandfather. Well, we'll stay at a hotel, but we, uh, my grandfather and I, I'm the only boy, so I have all sisters. So, oh, okay. How so many sisters do you two. have? Two. Yeah, two sisters, yeah, okay. Shout out to Annie and Deb. <clears throat> um, so with that, with that... Man, we all into sports. All three of us. My, my sister plays sports. Uh, my, both both sisters play sports. Volleyball, basketball. You know, the, I, I can, the only thing I sucked in was was basketball. You know, I can I can I can make the hoop, but I had no no game. I I, I was always into hitting, so football yeah. was my thing. Yeah. So, so my, you know what? Before my mom passed, she framed my football pictures too and sent them to me. So I gotta I gotta hang them up because I just moved and and I gotta put those on the wall because. Cause she was, she was getting sick at the time. So for her to take the time out to, I didn't even know she'd know where they were, the pictures were. And she was like, "Yo, look what I did!" And yeah. Frame my pictures. So yeah, condolences, man. I yeah, remember you, you posting that on Instagram yeah, about yeah, she your died mom passing COVID. away. Thank goodness it wasn't from COVID either. You know, so uh, man, and and but my dad in 2018, she was in 2020, but the dates were three days apart. He died mm. uh, June 8th. She died June 11th. You know, wow. so, but the good thing is they lived, you know, she, she made it to 91, he made it to 89, and I was on the prom tour with Royce, with Royce, uh, the prom two tour, my mom, I mean, my dad was not doing well, we're doing a meet and greet for the second show of the tour, and my, and my dad uh, called my sister and said he wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And and already we knew he was in the hospital, but I'm like, oh boy. Yeah. He gets on the phone, and this is how old school he is, and how real he kept it. He said, "Son, I need you to call the Undertaker. They don't, you know, they don't say funeral director. Yeah. He said, I need you to call the Undertaker and make my my funeral arrangements because I feel like it's about that time to go." And wow. I'm like, "You sure?" He's like, "Yeah." And he was exactly right. I flew home the next day, put the tour on hold. Went down to handle my business, got him. He said, I want to die in my house because he built this house from scratch on the empty land in Prairie View. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the, st the house we still take care of to this day. He went in there. We brought him home. And he was gone in two days. Wow. But, and you know, so ill after all the crying and all that during the process to get to the end. The day he died, we were watching the Cavs play uh, the Golden State Warriors game, game seven. And that, that's when the, uh, the Cavs, I mean, the Warriors won that one. I can't, I, this may have been this, this, it was the one after the Cavs, I mean, uh, yeah, the Cavs won that year before. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I walk in and see, the, see that they're getting stomped, go in the room, check on him. He had just passed. And then when me and my sister and my nephew went in there, check on him, instead of crying, we high-fived like, yo, we did it because that was the way he wanted to go out. So, you know, shit, you couldn't have written a better story. Yeah, you man. Know. Condolences, man. Yeah, but we're, we're all good. I mean, we, we carried the, the good energy that he left. He was hardcore with everything as far as do the right thing. Don't be late, and I'm the worst at being on time. Uh, I've gotten better, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start at 4. I got here four oh seven, so that's not yeah. bad. <laughs> so how, was, how did Texas kind of mold you into 
the producer that you are now or the DJ that you are or how did music that you used to listen to yeah. when you were coming up, how did that shape you into a lot, a lot of it is because of the fact that we didn't have any rap music as a kid. You know, being I'm born in '66, right. our, our upbringing is all soul music and mm -hmm. funk, and you know, like you know, even the early Parliament records weren't like they were when Mothership Connection came out. They they were doing doo wop stuff and you know stuff like that. They were called the Parliament. Shout out to they, Amp too, man. Oh rest yeah, in peace, Amp. yeah. Rest in peace to Amp, with man. Parliament. Yeah, it's crazy that you had the JD shirt on. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I remember Q-Tip met uh, JD through AMP, you know, mm -hmm. saying shout out to Dilla. We've had sessions together. We've hung out together. Good dude. And then more Detroit connection, yeah. you know. So, uh, yeah, AMP, love, brother. Rest but, in peace. Um, yeah, so really with, uh, with my mother being an art teacher, Right out of our hallway in our house, she would sit right by her stereo and paint every day. Mm -hmm. And like I said, she taught everybody in our neighborhood, everybody that know, that knows me and my mom and my dad and my sisters, know my mother for art. And almost everybody in our town has a, an original painting of something she did in their home. You know, oh. so she's known like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with her playing so many records and stuff, um. She was just up on everything from Minnie Ripperton to Grover Washington to Isaac Hayes to Al Green to Aretha. Uh, you know, Luther was brand new when I was coming up. He was, you know, he, he was more of a background singer yeah. and became famous. But in my childhood, there was no Prince yet. There was no Luther, you know, that, that era. Luther, Prince, and all that is more my era of growing from a child to a teenager to adulthood because of my sisters. So what did you use to sneak and listen to? I think. Oh no! Uh, only thing I that sneak and listen to is, is, like is uh, the the Richard Pryor album. <laughs> but they, they she used to hide them under her bed, and and um and my sister and them be like, hey, look, uh, they, they, they would be like, yo, look, look what's under the bed, and under the mattress, and it'd be eight track tapes of Richard Pryor, Lawanda Page, mm -hmm. who y'all know is on, on Esther, <laughs> uh, on the, on Sanford and Son, um. What else she had under there? Red Fox. She had a, um, oh man, a Dick Gregory album. Yeah, Dick Gregory. Uh, the um, oh man, what's his name? The one that did Here Come the Judge. Uh, uh, he, they consider that one of the first rap records. Um, oh man, he, uh, oh man. I'm he, drawing the uh, blank myself. I'm looking at his face right now. He, Flip Wilson. No, not Flip Wilson. We used to watch the Flip Wilson show. Um. Damn, he had here come the judge. What was his name? Uh, I don't know. I'm drawing yeah, he had the TV. We should moms Mabley. We yeah, should watch yeah, yeah. her. Dolomite. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> definitely Rudy Ray Moore. All that stuff. So when they would go to parties and stuff, we would listen to all that stuff. And you know, mm -hmm. uh, back in that day, it's like, Ooh. yeah, yeah. They said, they said, Ooh, you know, that, that was like a big deal. So, yeah. uh, so. Uh, during that, just during that time, there was so much music in the house. You're we're pretty much up on everything. Mm -hmm. You know, Maze was starting to be a new thing that that, that we were growing up into. Frankie but Beverly. The, yeah, but but prior to that, it was just she had just tons of jazz, tons of soul. She had James Brown, of course, and uh, and then my mom used to go to concerts. Yeah. Yeah, heavy. So uh, we used to go to concerts all the time. See the Jackson Five. We see uh, Ike and Tina Turner. I got lost at Ike and Tina Turner's concert because me being uh, the little mischievous kid, yeah. I'm dancing in the aisle, doing my trying to do my little steps, yeah. watching Tina Turner wiggle, <laughs> and then I ended up going too far from the aisle, and I end up in the wrong aisle, and I'm looking around, can't find my parents and my sisters. Oh no! I start crying. The usher says, "You know, you don't know where you were." I'm like, "No, I can't find my family." They take me to the front of the stage to make an announcement that there's a kid lost. And Tina Turner makes the announcement and says, wow. Yo, um, there's a kid up here who's lost. <laughs> and, it's, wow. and it's me. And my parents had to come get me. But hey, I got to be right next to Tina. You wow. know, Ike was still there then. So. I wish you two was out back then. <laughs> we like, this See, was the little... day when Preem got lost. Yeah, so, so, I, so I could Tina Turner and the Ikeettes are very, and the, the whole review is very special to me. So rest in peace to Tina and Ike. They, they both gone, but uh, left a stain on my brain for sure. 
Yeah. So how did you end up going back to, because you went to Brooklyn and then you went back to Prairie View to go yeah, to school. Yeah, um, but like I said, staying with my grandfather all the time, he he was into to baseball, so mm-hmm. he would take me to baseball games, you know, because I, I was into Houston and everything, Astros, Rockets, you know, the, you, you name it. I was just Houston, Houston, Houston. Mm-hmm. So when I started staying with him and uh, I was into vi- – uh, pinball machines mm-hmm. they were really popular in the 70s and 80s and uh, he would always take me to playland which was on 42nd street so we would catch a yankee game and do a, mainly a daytime game go after the yankee game he'd take me to playland and give me a whole stack of quarters and i would just play pinball and i would battle people you know because i was really quick with my i guess that's part of the scratching and all yeah. that i was quick with my hands and i used to battle people like hey i play in pinball stay there all day and then as i got older closer to maybe like 13 he took me to Playland, and now I'm seeing the B-Boys out there yeah. with the boom box, and they breaking and doing all this and got the dope track suits, and I'm just like, what is this? And, you yeah. know, that, that's a new thing, especially in, for me, like from 79, 80, even 78, this is a new thing to see that I'm telling people in Texas, like, yo, you know, you, know, you come back from summer and you talk about what you did for the summer. Mm-hmm. I'm telling them, man, I saw a dude take two records of the same copy and make them play nonstop on beat. And, and they're like, no, you didn't. Yeah. And I'm like, yes, I did. It was still like a, like a UFO sighting. Yeah. It's like, you know, I saw this. It's like, nah, no, you Do you didn't. remember who the DJ was? No, not back then. Nah. It's just a guy with turntables, yeah. you know, on the street, yeah. you know, in Times Square. So you just you just in awe of these guys you know these are just regular native new yorkers that's doing what they're doing mm-hmm. but to tell it to your friends in texas you know we 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 don't have tv to even capture all you know yeah. video to capture it. so now i'm like when i get older i'm gonna move to new york but i'm just kind of pre-planning way off but as hip-hop started to build the only thing we had during my era at the time was rap a lot, you know, and they had the Ghetto Boys. This is before Scarface. Mm-hmm. This is before Willie D. <clears throat> and um, as they started to grow, um, the only other records that we knew besides anything under the rap a lot roster was one of our top DJs in Houston. His name is Captain Jack. He had a record called Don't Do It Like That Baby because whenever he would promote parties and stuff at the club on the radio he'd go don't do it like that baby and <laughs> you know and then he, then he put the record out so being that he was popular from just even doing a commercial to advertise the club the club mm-hmm. nights now the record was rocking also in the club too you yeah. know so i still have it have uh, uh, two copies of the vinyl so so you shout. you had to be the man at prayer view then like if at, you brought that back there, well, 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 the the at that time I st- I was always I started DJing parties. I wouldn't I couldn't scratch it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's later when I went back in '84 because I graduated high school. I went back in '84. I just knew how to blend really fast. I could take two records, just really push them together, and make the next one blend in. Yeah. I didn't know how to cut and scratch until I met a guy named R. P. Cola. His R. name P. is Randy Cola. Pettis. He was cutting up five minutes of funk from Yehudini. And I was just like stuck. He was from Corpus Christi, Texas. He was a student at Prairie View, and uh, he also DJed at Magic 102, which was our Hot 97 back in back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And so he would actually let me go with him to, and then he DJed at a club, which was our which was our tunnel. It was called the Rhinestone Wrangler, and there was a dope record store right across the street from Astro World, the amusement park, and the Astro Dome called sound waves mm-hmm. i got a job there and that's when my hip-hop career started to evolve because uh, i got a big up carlos garza who got helped me get the job because i knew so much about music prim is a historian yeah. i don't know if y'all knew this or not, <laughs> but i'm i'm fascinated man keep going i'm sorry yeah, shout out to carlos carlos got me the job and at sound waves it was a, a plethora of so many different people that came in the store. Pimps would come in there. Like, <laughs> like, like they were coming dipped out with the suit, the Stacey Adams, all the... the, the oh, so like one of my characters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, like, and like in Texas, Lattimore is a really popular artist. And they'd come in there and go, yo, you got some Lattimore? <laughs> Not Lattimore. <laughs> Lattimore. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, which one you want? he go, yo, let me get the new cassette. And you give him the new cassette, and he got the girls all all draped over him. You know, yeah. he's like, "Yeah, baby's gonna go and grab me a couple couple more tapes and stuff." <laughs> D- uh, drug dealers, just like Ice T on Power, yeah, like that, just yeah, w- yeah. rolling up. Okay, yep. So gotcha. I mean, just every facet of people from the hood 
came to sound waves and you had to know your music. You had to know Zydeco music. You had to know you had to know rock. You had to know jazz. You had to know soul, funk, everything. And um, since we knew so much music, and I was starting to get mixtapes from uh, from New York, from taping the radio with BLS, with Molly Marlin Magic. I was go go. I would even just go for the summer and then come right back with a whole bunch of tapes mm-hmm. of Red Alert, Chuck Chill Out, the Awesome Two, and find those records and then tell them that's what we need to order. Yeah. And we would uh, Southwest Wholesale was our distributor, and I'd call them and say, Hey, we need to get a couple of, of these, a couple of these, and we would always sell everything. I remember when Millie Vanilli came out. We were like, give us uh, 300 copies on 12 inch. And they were like, you sure? We were like, yeah, it's about to be a hit. Yeah. Next thing you know, everybody's like, there's a song called Girl, You Know It's True? Yeah, right there, top top shelf, you know. Yeah. Or people hum a song to you and we knew what it was. You know, that's how much we had to know music. Yeah. Once Billboard started to do a rap chart and Billboard, uh, Carlos became the rap reporter for Houston. So they were like, yo, uh, Stu Fine from Wild Pitch could say, hey, man, well, anything new happening out there? And he said, man, this is DJ that works here that's coming to New York trying to shop his demo tape. Yeah. And he's dope. You should check him out. And he's like, well, have him send it to me. Yeah. I told him don't send it because I'm not ready yet. It needs to be better. He still snuck a copy to him in New York and sent it to him. Guru, God bless him, of course, heard the demo tape, hear my demo tape, and he heard Lord Finesse's demo tape. He heard that. While he was in Boston? No, he, he, he was going back and forth. He was living okay. in Brooklyn now, but he was kind of going back and forth, mainly staying in Brooklyn at the time. Uh, his aunt lived in Brooklyn. Let him, let him rent a, a little piece of the apartment if he you know, paid his bills. So, yeah. <clears throat> but but he, the, he had other members of the group, and they, they, uh, they stayed in Boston and didn't really carry the, the, the whole journey where he's like, look, if y'all not going to come stay with me in New York, I'm taking the gangster name and going on with it. Because oh, so he had already established. Yeah, gangster, gangster was already out. Oh, yeah, because okay. Gangstar was really started by Big Suge. Yeah. Suge's brother, Suave D, was the DJ then. And Guru, it was the three of them. Suge so and Guru came, came up. So over tape. Yeah. Overtook the DJs. Yep. Uh, and uh, 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 Guru and Suge are the ones that came up with the name of the, lo- the logo, this chain and the star. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they created all of that stuff. So, because uh, both of them went to Morehouse for a brief t- period of time. So they brought you in. Mm-hmm. They brought me in after they heard my demo. They didn't like Top. We kept making better demos to see if we could get us signed. And then Top got frustrated with waiting so long that he decided to go into the military. Once he went to, went to the military, I'm like, dude, I'm not waiting for you to come back because he enlisted for four years. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm gone. I ain't got time. Yeah, if he said yeah. a year, I would have waited. Okay. But four, nah. Yeah. <laughs> I called them back and said, hey, man, Top just went to the military, so was, I'm by myself. And they're like, you're in. And that's that's how our journey started to uh, – uh, to, to move up and Words I Manifest was our first single which was the first video that we shot and he looked like Malcolm X and, So you, you know. was fresh out of college? Mm-hmm. I hadn't even graduated yet I was in my junior year What? Mm-hmm. Wow It was like what you said earlier So how did that conversation go with your mom? Like yeah I'm about to My mom was cool about it My pop w- wasn't really cool about it because he was like your son you uh, you have no plan you're right, like right, packing right. up to go to New York yeah. and you have no <laughs> plan the, 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 I think you So what year finish. was that? That was 85 85 yeah. Really more really more 86 Yeah 86 because I was a sophomore in 85 and at PV and my junior year is when I when I left. So yeah, eighty six. Okay. So yeah. after y'all formed the group, which that was like your first big break. Like yeah. what was your first like big break after that? Like like what was the album that came out that you was like, all well, right, cool. Well my first br- I wanna always say my my first big break as a producer, uh, before it got to the to the higher that. levels was really the fact that um, Lord Finesse sent his demo to Wild Pitch as well. Guru said, Shout check out him Finesse. out. What up, Nestor? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so they said, if you like it and co-sign Guru with, with that, we're going to sign him. So they signed me. I mean, they signed Lord Finesse and uh, gave him an album deal. And he brought in DITC. So there was no DITC yet. He brought in Showbiz as a producer. Mm -hmm. He brought in AG as an MC. He brought in Diamond D as a producer. And that's how we started to know them in the Bronx. And then as that went further, he brought Fat Joe. 
Mm-hmm. And then we met Joe. And then they, uh, Showbiz and, D- and uh, Diamond D said, we're going to start a crew and come up with a name for our crew. And, and they created the name Digging in the Crates Crew, which obviously, you know, is DITC. And yeah. that's how that was born. Once that started to tr- to go, and uh, I started to, maybe like 1992 when we were doing our Daily Operation album, yeah. the one that Take It Personal, and actually Dwick, because Dwick really is from the- That is my his, joint, Thank you, man. shout to Greg. Shout to Greg and Smooth. Joint. Yeah, yeah and, nice and smooth, Yeah, because you know, that came out really in 92. It, it, it's on the Hard to Earn album, which came out in 94 because we wanted to put it on uh, it was a b-side just on the 12 inch single mm-hmm. we wanted to put it on the album and they and they they didn't didn't add it to the album once the song blew up so i didn't want any gangstar album being out where you can never find dwick being it was just an unreleased b-side mm-hmm. so we put it on hard to earn so and obviously it's on our uh full clip uh, greatest hits album too but it was meant to be out on daily operation once we did that album and Dwig got big, uh, Take It Personal blew up, Ice-T reached out to me to remix Lifestyles of the Rich, Rich and Infamous for his single uh, from, from the original Gangsta album. And then from there, I got a call from KRS-One, which for us, you know, KRS-One wants to talk to me. And he, right. he said, I'm going to do a new album <laughs> called Return of the Boom Return of the Bap. Boom Bap. And it's so crazy that you know, me, Showbiz, you know, Showbiz did Sound of the Police. Um, uh, Kick Capri produced, I think, three songs on there. KRS produced songs on there. Mm-hmm. First time I ever met Channel Live, and KRS is in there doing the record Madism, just making it right down the spot on, on the SB uh, 1200. And oh, it was just a dope. fun ride. And just so crazy now, because now when they categorize hip hop, you got trap, you got drill, you, you got bounce, and then they'll say uh, uh, booty music, and then they'll say you got boom bap. Mm-hmm. And uh, we weren't really saying that that term is just, but once that album came out, now that's considered a category. Boom bap is now a, a style of, of hip hop. Yeah. You know? Now, speaking of that, like, what do you think the current state of hip hop is now? The current state now is it reminds me of how it used to be when we had to find the dope stuff. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, like now, you can, because I don't want to hear kitty rap. I'm, I'm, I'm grown, right. you know? But uh, a lot of the younger artists that are out now cater to the kids, and that's cool because we were the kids during that generation. Mm-hmm. Now they're the kids, and so I don't hate on them. A lot of them don't have the the lyricism part that, that, that we're raised on because in our era, if you couldn't rhyme and your rhymes a week, they, you either get booed, stuff thrown at you, or beat yeah. up. Yeah. You, you would get jumped in the club like, yo, your rhymes a <laughs> week, and they would jump you. You know what I'm saying? Like That's where we come from, so I still yeah. like the, the pure lyricism part of having just dope bars and having a hot pen and that's one thing i like about cole and drake and and kendrick they they're way younger but you know they're in their late 30s now about to hit their 40s but they still want to really put their pen game in, in they into, respect the craft in, in there exactly where, where i can recite some of their stuff yeah you know and then i have with me having a 12 year old he likes sexy red you know right. so now i'm going to be in that so <laughs> let that Really, you know, like <laughs> that and ski, and, you know, like I'm up on that because yeah. I, 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 when we go to when we go to practice, like if I'm going to base, uh, baseball practice, mm-hmm. I'm driving, I let him play what he wants. Someone will come on, like, damn, who's that? And it might be Yeet. Yeah, and I'll look at that it. My I, son like Yeet. Yeah, and then yeah. I go and take a picture of it, and then put it in my Serato. And then he's singing the lyrics, you know, and he's, mm-hmm. he's blah, 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 blah. Then, then he's playing Future. Then he's playing, uh, <laughs> you, you name it. Like I said, from Sexy Red all the way down to, he'll play Bound by Coyle Ye. Ray. Or, yeah, yeah, you know, Ray, the, yeah. you know, yeah, which I, I, I would, I liked, I've liked her off rip just because she's, you know, put her pen game down from the mm-hmm. first time I've heard her rap. But, but now I'm taking pictures of everything I don't know that he's, he's up on so that I can, you know, he loves Scissor. You know, big mm-hmm. time. You know, and again, he's a twelve year old. I'm like, what you have once? <laughs> you, you hear what she's saying in the lyrics? You know, like even even <laughs> like even when 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 sexy red says, "Let that breathe," I say, "You know what the goes no." And, but but he's singing every bit of the lyrics. I'm like, all right, I'll school you later. You know, thirteen is around the corner, so you're you're, you're a few months away. 
<laughs> yeah, so yeah, but but that that's uh that's my take on like the state of hip hop now. Um, I, I'm glad the 50 year mark finally hit. Uh, Speaking it, of that, mm-hmm. do you? What is your opinion on the, the 50 years? Like, do you think it was? I know you're not gonna hit like every single thing when it right. comes to 50 years. Like, for me, I thought Heavy D should have been celebrated a little mm-hmm. bit more. Mm-hmm. I thought uh, MC Hammer should have been celebrated a little right. bit more. DJs, like, what do, what do you and, think? And I saw it? Hammer say why he didn't. He's, he's he said he's been invited to mad stuff and he turned them down. KRS. I, I totally dug his point. I, I dug both of their points mm-hmm. of why they I think why right. they turned down. Yeah, it, it's, it, it is. It's like everybody's right because even with the Grammys doing a, a special on it, at least it was curated by somebody who's authentic that we all respect. LL, you know, mm-hmm. LL to have Rock the Bells radio. Yeah, and I can turn it on and hear PSK come on, and mm-hmm. then I, I can hear, and then shoot, I can hear turn this mother out from Hammer, and then after that, you you hear uh, Afro Puffs from Rage, you know, mm-hmm. and then you hear the sequence funk you up, and then that, then from that he he plays Cold Crush live tapes in different segments. He does the sample uh, thing. So you'll he, never forget, yeah, man. Yeah, so, so the, the fact that it was curated, you know, I know Questlove and, uh, and LL were a big part of putting it together. At least, they, you know, at least you get you had Rock him there. You, you had two live crew. It was good to see Luke up there. You see, you had Boozy up there. Mm-hmm. You know, you had a nice mixture of everybody. So whether you turn it down and, 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 uh, and don't do it, I understood both sides where, like, like you just said, no one's wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, it was just their opinion to turn down the invitation to be a part of it. And honestly, KRS is the only person I ever heard on the song "I'm Still Number One" say, 50 years down the line, you can start this because we'll be the old school artists." And he said, "And even at that time, I'll say a rhyme, a brand new style, ruthless and wild, running around, spending money, having fun, because even then, I'm still number one." Number like what? I was like, "What? Wow. What? You know?" What? And so I've always been like, "Damn, wait till it gets to 50 years," and this is probably 20 years in. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, I remember we did the 30 year. A tribute on the BET Awards. There was no BET Hip Hop Awards at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, shout to Jesse Collins. He, he he got me to put it all together. Uh, MC Light was. Are you the, like curated it? Yeah, oh, the, um, dope, it, I was dope, the, the, dope. the music director for it. So uh, I I was able to get MC, we couldn't get Salt and Pepper or Latifah. So I said get MC Light to do Paper Thin. Mm-hmm. She came. Uh, Slick Rick and Dougie came. Uh, Melly Mel came and uh, the Sergio Gang. Um, public Enemy. It was just dope because, uh, and the Makai Pfeiffer transitioned each one where we go to another song and to look in the crowd and see Pharrell and uh, Andre 3000 and Big Boy mm-hmm. screaming and singing every song, yeah. and then knowing how classic this stuff meant to, to all of them. It was just dope to see that, seeing Taraji screaming and doing, I'll do years if I pull this trigger. Like everybody yeah. was singing every record. Cause it it is so pure, you can never deny timeless music like that. And that was in the thirty year era. Yeah. So, you know, it, it it was it was good to be a part of that. It was good to be a part of the Jam Master J tribute when he passed away. Uh me, Kit Capri, um, Grandmaster Flash and Jazzy Jeff, you know, there was never a live tribute to a DJ that passed on national television and mm-hmm. You know that that came out flawless. It was just uh, fun to be a part of all these things. Even the cipher, the cipher started with us. Yeah, um, that was, that's mean, dope. Yeah, cipher is dope. Built, you know, I don't do it anymore, but I did so many years. The first year I had a gig, and last minute I I, did, I couldn't make it to the shoot, and DJ Scratch of VPMD filled in for me, and then from there. Jesse was like, yo, we're going to keep doing it. You know, mm-hmm. we're going to get more MCs, more MCs. And it just kept growing and growing. It got to a point where people calling me, yo, I want to be in the cypher this year. Yeah. I'm like, yo, I ain't got nothing to do with that. <laughs> it's whoever they pick. I just picked the beat. Mm-hmm. I would just pick it, but I always kept it break beats because that took it back to the lunchroom table. Yeah. You're beating on the beating on the table at school, that type of thing, playing spades mm-hmm. in the morning or crazy eights or dominoes or, you know, I didn't know what pity pad was until I came to New York, but, you yeah. know. <laughs> well, I mean, like, if you think about, like, all your hits, like, you got hits with Jay-Z, with M.O.P., with Mob Deep, like, some of everybody. Like, how do you go from that to say, I'm doing a song with Christina Aguilera? Right. Like, how that, did that come about? With Christina, uh, we got a call. Actually, her her ex-husband, uh, Jordy, uh, was a hip-hop head, he and his brother, and, um, and they 
put her on to the music that I did because she was looking for a certain style and mm -hmm. she wanted to incorporate jazz sampling and stuff like that as well because she was taking it back to that era. And once she heard my, she, she said, she said, when I met her in, in California, she said, I love group home. I'm like, what? Oh, okay. Yeah, she liked group home. She loved Gangstar. She liked uh -huh. Jay with the Damager and stuff like that. She liked the Biggie stuff I did. So we, man, we clicked. She wasn't even married yet. She was about, she was getting, she was getting her wedding together. So she was going back and forth from, you know, just different things she had to pick out for the wedding and then come back in the room and write with me and mm -hmm. and then go back back in the room and then record and more wedding people are showing up and it was just nonstop, nonstop. And then next thing you know, we finished the album and then she said, hey, I want to invite you to my wedding. So that was my first celebrity wedding Dude. to ever go to. And talk about over the top. It was one of the most unique weddings I ever seen. So while you were there at the reception, were you looking at the DJ like, Hold on, what is this guy doing? You talking there? about at the uh, wedding reception? Yeah. Actually, it was DJ AM. God, oh, okay. God rest him, man. Yeah. So uh, he. <laughs> yeah. So he so toyed he... it. And we were in a cave in a, in a, because it was in Napa Valley. So we're actually in a cave, in a wine cave. Oh, yeah. So, snap. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, AM was killing it. He's yeah. na he was nasty on the wheels anyway. So oh okay, so yeah. he got your blessing. Then oh, once you yeah, saw it was yeah, AM, yeah. you was like, oh, me, all right, me, you good? Yeah, me and AM DJed at the Playboy Mansion. Oh uh, Back gosh. in nineteen ninety seven, I think, mm. uh, or ninety eight. Uh, it, it was between ninety seven ninety eight because uh, I remember uh, the I, I wore a Biggie Born Again uh, long sleeve shirt because that they were about to drop the album and. I had just done the Limp Biscuit record with Method Man and, and Limp Biscuit, and uh, Fred Durst hired me to be the DJ at the Playboy Mansion for his mm. pajama, his pajama party. Mm. So, how many times did you leave the turntable to uh, go, go out and party? Just go to the bathroom. That was it. And uh, <laughs> but there was a lot of bunnies hopping around, and uh, you know we we definitely were hopping after the bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was fun. Rest in peace with my homie headquarters. He got kicked out twice, and I had to go get security to let him back in. Then he got kicked out again, and I had to go get him back in. And you know, so yeah, he he that, that, those those are fun times, man. But yeah, AM DJed after me, mm -hmm. and uh, and and um, I, I remember uh, uh, Limp Biscuit had a, their first single before the Method Man record was called Nookie. And yeah, I, and I remember, yeah, I remember Hugh Hefner came over and, and was like, I he wanted to just do a quick little announcement, and you know, I just want to thank everybody for coming. <laughs> and um, Fred Durst, I just want to say one thing: thank God for Nookie. <laughs> and I'll never get him saying that. <laughs> thank God for Nookie, you know, and and saying it with that exact type of type of voice. And then but, uh, next thing you know, <laughs> uh, I remember I played. Ghostface one, uh, and it just one. came on one, and and all the all the Playboy bunnies was Dude. rocking and everything. I got the crazy pictures. I'll show you. That's my joint, yeah, man. man. So they were dancing to that type of hip hop. Oh. I didn't have to, uh, you know, tone it down just because because I said what style you want. Yeah, he said keep it raw hip hop. Ooh. And I didn't have Serato then. This is just vinyl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, shout so to you was you was bringing in the crates. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know when Hef. How when how Hef, do you like that? Like, cause you know it's like I don't know. It's kind of like barbecuing, right? Like right. you know you getting the charcoal and all that. But yeah. now they got the Traeger out. You uh -huh. just plug it in and just go. Like now it's different. So it's like yeah. Serato. You just double click and it plays the music. I I, I wish. <clears throat> with Serato, um, shout to DJ, the legend DJ, the icon DJ Jazzy J. Jazzy J had to, and Jazzy Jeff were two people that had to convince me to switch to Serato because, like, hell no, nah, man, I'm doing vinyl. That's cheating. And they're like, no, it's yeah. not. They're like, yo, you got to understand, doing Serato is like a gift because you carried crates for years. You, flew to Europe and your crates are getting lost on the plane yeah. and you have to wait for it to get delivered to your hotel and you know you, you, you flew with six and only two came and yeah. you're worried about oh my records are going to be missing for life and then you got a gig mm -hmm. and you don't have all your records <laughs> um, 
it, they're like, this is a reward. Now you put 10,000 records in there. You don't have to carry the big crates and the big speakers and all that stuff. You just carry your laptop. Yeah. And I was against it for years before I got into it. I mean, obviously now, it's, it's, I always felt like if you got Serato, you should qualify for it. It's like a credit check. Mm. You own, you own over, over a thousand records? Uh, no, nope, can't get Serato. Yeah. You know, like, like, <laughs> like it, it's for people that- pay your dues Yeah, first. pay your dues to, yeah. hard to earn one because it got to a point where all these famous actors and-, and Celebrities. Yeah, celebrities. Celebrities are get, DJs getting, now. What, yeah, what do you think about that? Getting hundreds of thousand dollars and they suck on that party. <laughs> and that shit's going all boom, 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 click, 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 boom, boom, boom. boom. No like, blending, like nah, nothing. Just... And, and they're getting big money. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that really can turn the party out and they're dope, getting, getting low numbers, you know, to get paid. You yeah. know? So, um, it, it, that's the only flaw that I don't like about it. But other than that, it's one of the best tools. Oh, the only flaw about. is like, you know, everybody think they could DJ. Yeah, everybody think they could DJ because they got a laptop. I mean, anybody could put the hottest records in their computer. Mm -hmm. But how do you get, how do you set the party up? Can you rock a crowd? Yeah. You know, and not just throw on the hot record. You know, we still like the how you set it up. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you could be in a bar or a club and you'd be doing this and another song come on, you go, ooh. Yeah. And it'll be a song you know, but just the way they brought it in make you go, wow. Yeah. But now it's just dun 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 dun. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. everybody's it's like somebody bumping the we, table. DJs, like, you, yeah. yeah. The DJs, we're sitting there going, oh man, did you hear that transition? We're still hard on everybody like that. You know, yeah. we, because DJs here with two ears. You know, I could be talking to you going, yo, man, you see the game last night? That shit was dope. Pick a, pick a, pick a, boom. Yeah, y'all, let's go. Yeah. Hey, man, so uh, what's uh, going like on now? Like multitask. Yeah, I, it, yeah. We, can, we can hear everything. We could be in a conversation just even talking, just hanging at the bar and hear a bad transition and go, and it'll be a dope song and go, yo. <laughs> and we still want the quality yeah. of what a DJ is. So, yeah, yeah so. Get tight, people. Get tight on those wheels, man. You know. What do you think about this AI generated stuff, man? Like they just taking people's voice and I'm still not with it. Um, you know, maybe as you know, I'm not as well versed on it. I've seen all the little things they did. So when they tried to do the, the Drake record, yeah, and all of that, and and uh, they were talking about even making it be nominated for a Grammy, and you know, just all this stuff. Wow, you know, and how it interprets your voice and stuff. I'm still not just not in in that scene. Um, I'm watching it, but not to the degree where I'm like, yeah, let it happen. I got <laughs> I got so many questions I want to ask going, you, dude. Go. Like it's just all over the place, man. But uh, what what's the best beat you made, in That's in your the, opinion? I know it's most it's, it's, asked question. I know it's so many, it's the but most it's asked like. Question. When the, I listen to a Reasonable Doubt, and it's, it's what, D Evils? D Evils, yeah. D Evils. Mm. It sounds so polished, man. And right. then they hear Snoop on there, like how you mix Snoop in there, you use his sample. That was Jay's idea. Word? Yeah, he called me and said, I want to do a song called D Evils. He said, I'm going to rap the first verse to you, a cappella. Mm. did the first verse. He said, I want you to scratch. Dear God, I wonder, can you save me? Illuminati with my mind, soul, and my body. Secret society trying to. Oh, see, so he out. already had the song in his head. He had it all in his head, and he even I can't die, I can't die. He said, "That's where I want the scratches to go." I said, "Meet me at D and D." I put it down exactly the way. And then, now he didn't know what the beat was gonna sound like, but once he described the lyrics and how dark he wanted the the music to be, mm -hmm. I just put it together. And as soon as he walked in, he's like, "That's it." Is that just how you work with? With Jay, or is that just how you work in general? Uh, like it, it's either or. I can walk in with a blank canvas and just create a beat. Think uh, I, I like creating a beat based on what I think you think you would sound good on. Guru used to always call me a beat tailor because because with Guru, he'll make a list of our, on our albums and have all the titles already and put in parentheses what the song's about. And I'll just look at the list and just say, you know what, I'll work on the sixth one today. And in no order. And just make the beats match the titles. If it's not that way, I'll just make beats that I think sound good to your voice, your tone, the way you rap, other songs I like that you did. And then from there, we build a song and they write their lyrics and then we come up with a title. And then I'll come up with the scratch hook. So mm -hmm. either I'll come up with the hook, mainly obviously I do it, but Jay, Big... Um, and Guru were 
three people that have always been like, oh, you can scratch this. And not on every song, you know, like uh, not every Gangstar song, he's like scratch on this or whatever, but mm -hmm. he'll still bring up scratch ideas and, mm -hmm. and, and they'll work. Have you ever done something for another artist that Guru was like, man, why ain't you get that one? Like, yeah. why, ain't, why ain't we do yep. that one? Yep. So, so and, many and, times. Huh? And now the only difference is, and everybody that knows about my career know, I don't have the beat already. And then he heard it and it's like, man, you should have given that to me. It was done the same way that I do it with Gangstar. I make it when you show up to the studio and I cook it for you right there. So oh, wow. <clears throat> so none of us know what it's gonna sound like until I make the beat. That's it's just crazy. when the finished product is done and he hears, he's like, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's, that's one of the of things those. where like, man, I wish I was in the studio that day. Yeah, but but the good thing is, you know, one thing that every time we got back together to do another gangster album, our songs were just as solid. You know, mm -hmm. I might have a hit with four other artists and then we drop a mass appeal and cold yeah. in the streets and, boop, and boop, yeah boop, so boop, so we, we have another hot album that that was selling and you know so all of that stuff we, we never had nothing that was weaker than stuff i worked with other artists are you you trying to get off the hook you still ain't told me was one of your best beats man well mass appeal, mass appeal is definitely one of my boop, favorites boom boom Boom, boom. Uh, you know my steez is just whew, I love that record. I love that record because it was our first time returning back after four years of taking a break. Mm -hmm. You hip hop, you take a four year break and then come back. You don't know what the vibe's gonna be to come back after four years and that's the first thing we dropped and it took off right away. And yeah. it still sounded like a good gangstar record. Yeah. It didn't sound like. Uh, uh, it's not like the other four albums. Nah, it was actually it. It was our first gold mm -hmm. because you know that that one was just action packed. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, I uh, love you know my steez. Um, what else I like a lot? Um, I did love, you did you like did you like Dwick? Oh yeah. Or you were just like Dwick? We did for fun because um, on the uh, nicest move album, ain't a damn thing changed. Greg wanted to loop the manifest instrumental and rap over it on a posse cut. Mm -hmm. So we did it. I was against it, but at the same, you know, because I didn't want to re bring back a record that we had already done, but you know, it's not, a, it's on their album. They put their crew on, the Guru's also on it. I said, okay, so since y'all did a posse cut, we want to do one with y'all on our record. Mm -hmm. So that's all it was. And next thing you know, Dwick just became the summertime hit. And it's so crazy. Dub C was there from, <laughs> from west, west Coast, yes uh -huh. west side connection from really from the mass circle ice cube and uh west side connection and just being uh and low profile he's been in so many he wears so many hats shout the dub recipes his brother dj crazy tunes um we've been family man since 89 mm -hmm. and uh he was there and don Barron from the masters of ceremony was there you know, which Grant, that was Grand Pooba and them's first group. So, uh, yeah, they, they were there for Dwick. So, that, even that's history. Yeah. Dove seed, you know, khakis and, yeah. and, and, and house guy. shoes. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and watching me make Dwick, you know. So, oh, good times, dope. man. Real good times. That's dope. I got a technical question from my guy, uh, Jay Illa, out what in up, Chicago, Jay man. He, he, he asked me, to ask you, why do you have both of the turntables on one side of the mixer? I don't. I don't anymore. But the reason why, because when I used to go practice at R.P. Cola's dorm room, the way the part, the desk we study at, you know, do your homework or whatever, mm -hmm. it was only about this wide. So the it, when he tried to put the turntable in the mixer in the middle, it would the turntable would hang off the off the. I mean, they would hang too much off the edge. So he would put the mixer here, turn the turntables to, you know, close to the side and push it that so it could fit on the desk. So being that that's how he had it set up in his dorm room, that's how I learned. Wow. Yeah. If he had had it left and right, I, I, I'm still not nasty. I cross over when I do, do all my cutting with the left. Yeah. Um, I use the fader and I do this. But I, a lot of people that did that see me do it that way can't do the fader both ways because they get confused that the one on the far right yeah. the fader goes to the right the one on the left that's to the right you go to the left so mm -hmm. 
it was confusing where now I could do either or. But that, that and then I saw a, a picture of uh, uh, Malcolm McLaren, the world famous Supreme team. Remember the record Buffalo Gals? No. You know, do Buffalo Gals going around the outside, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. record. Okay. When that record came out, they had an EP that came out called Do You Like Scratching? And they had a GLI mixer in the front and turntables pushed together. And I was like, I don't want to bite that style. Yeah. But since RP teaches me in the, in the dorm room with this way, I'm going to stick to this way. And for years, I toured that way with them both on the right. Now, I, I do left and right just mm -hmm. to hop on and get get to it especially if you share the same turntables at a gig mm -hmm. you don't want to be like well now the music's got to stop because we got to move this over yep. and the crowds are sitting there going yo man when y'all gonna play some music yeah <laughs> so now i just hop on plug in and i'm ready to rock yeah. but that's why the rp cola's dorm room that was holly hall which is torn down now now they're apartments for the for college students but it was holly hall if you was in holly hall it was going Hanging down. Out, huh? Yeah, it was going down. <laughs> yeah, those were good old days. Hey man, I want to thank you, man, because you you sent me the uh, I had the varsity Letterman jacket with uh, oh, the, the collab you did with Amir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it came with like a little miniature uh, turntable, turntable, yeah, with the little miniature uh, album Record, yeah. I put in the uh, song Westside you did with Westside Gun. Side Gun. Street, yeah. yeah, man, that was dope. That's a dope song. How, how did you uh, link up with uh, Westside? Um, well, we've been working together for a few years. Mm -hmm. Me, the whole Griselda and BSF, uh, Benny and Conway, and mm -hmm. um, and I met actually uh, two Static Selector and actually Alchemist were the ones that were pushing me to give them a chance to be heard because I, I was doing live from the headquarters uh, on Sirius, and they wanted to come to my show, <laughs> and so I hadn't heard Benny yet. I hadn't heard Conway. I only heard West Side Gun. I thought he was a kid because you know, yeah, hey yeah, yeah, hey yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so hearing that, hey, yeah. I was like, what was he a t like a teenager? He said, no, he's a grown dude. He said, <laughs> he, said he looks nothing like the voice. <laughs> then I see him and he's all, yeah, you know. The, the, but but he's a he he's a great great dude. They whole crew is just really good dudes. Shout out to Buffalo, and um, uh, once we uh, met. Um, one day I was in L.A. and I was at Alchemist's house. He goes, yo, I know you heard of West Side Gun. If you're a Conway, mm -hmm. he's down with them too. And I was like, nah. And he played me like about five joints. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. he can spit too. All right. And that's how I got into Conway. So a day, I ended up having both of them on my show together. Then from there, I, I heard Benny last. And, mm -hmm. and now, now look, Benny is like completely catapulted where they're all just re really hot just to, in, on the scene. Rhyme spitters. So uh, that trickled down to, uh, I did a few singles with them. I've, I've been on a few, few of their albums. And then um, Mike Amiri went to the same high school that Alchemist went to. And oh, wow. so, so Mike Amiri hit up Al Alchemist and said, hey, I'm trying to get with Premier to do this this uh, limited edition clothing piece, and I want and I, he saw my, he saw my batter band perform on Tiny Desk. When he saw me on Tiny Desk, he said, "Man, the way you remade your songs and played them and extended them, especially Moment of Truth, I want you to do something like that for my Paris uh, release of my fall fashion show, Dope. and we'll also launch a, a premiere line, you mm -hmm. know, limited edition." And he said, "Hear the songs I want." And he's like, "I want Big L, uh, Platinum Plus. I want Above the Clouds." You know, he, he knows his hip hop. He said, "You know, it's bugged out to see people like Mike and Miri and them say you were the soundtrack to me in high school because yeah. I never thought that would happen. Where I'm the old guy that, <laughs> that y'all grew up on me, yeah. and, and, and you know, because I grew up on Melly Mel and Curtis Blow and mm -hmm. Run DMC and all that stuff, and now these kids are growing up on me. He came to see me. We picked all the songs that he wanted." started rehearsing with my band we, we we did the fashion show right before the day we got to paris he said yo you know what uh well no the day he met me he said i need a beat that sounds like almost like it's you're walking in the ocean and the breeze is blowing but the models are walking and it's almost like they're walking on a on a record instead of a runway so that goes straight it'd be like a record and walk in a circle like on a record yeah. and y'all would be in the middle of the hole yeah. which is how he tried to actually set us up where the whole of the record would be the band we playing right there and they walk around us but <clears throat> they couldn't get the uh stage to just develop that way you know with a short period of time so he just gave us a stage but being that that was his idea i played him a, tra a track 
uh, and, and he liked it and said that I want that to be the theme of the uh, of the fashion show mixed oh, in with the other stuff. That's dope. Right when we got there, maybe a day before, he says, "Yo, man, I want to do some behind the scenes footage with Westside Gun flanked with models all rubbing on him, and he's mm -hmm. like the player, and he's backstage, and and he's chilling with all these flies." Just like the record store, then. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you got that Latimo. <laughs> Latimo. And and, 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 uh, and so he said. I want him to do a rap to that beat. And I was like, all right, well, how are we going to get it done? We're, we're coming to Paris. He said, I'll get him to do it and send it to you, see if you like it. He sent it. I was like, yeah, we, we, we're going we're gonna to mess with it. Then Mike said, we're going to cancel that and do it maybe some other time. Now it's about time to drop the, the line. Now that we're back after, after the fall, uh, we're back in New York. And now he's talking about, um, you know what? Uh, I'm going to put the record on hold, but now my manager, Ian, wanted to put the record out, and he's like, let's do it. Mm -hmm. West Side Gun added one of his artists, uh, Rome Streets, who had just signed to Griselda, and put him on it, which was not the plan, but mm -hmm. since he was on it and his verse was good, now it's both of them on the record. Yeah. And I said, well, we'll put it out ourselves, which we did through our label, TTT, and then once we put it out, I was like, we need to have a video, you know. So I shot a video with two of my camera guys. Um, shot to Poe and um, and Erickson, who actually films the Joe Button podcast. Mm -hmm. We just shot it in the garage, man, and 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 just got some footage standing outside the Amiri store, and just to have some performance footage. And uh, I was like, yo, we could just wear the jacket, so we help promote when the when the clothes drop, mm -hmm. and it just worked out. We sent it to Mike Amiri. He saw it. Was like, yo. That's perfect. I'll help work the video with y'all, and everything dropped that that following week, and we were off to the races. So, in the spirit of me wearing, you know, the JD shirt, yeah. J Dilla, rest in peace. Do you you had any cool like Dilla stories? Because I know everybody, um, everybody got different stories of seeing him in his basement. Yeah, and... just the day that me and D'Angelo were working on Devil's Pie mm -hmm. for the Voodoo album. Dilla was there, and um, and I brought Alchemist with me because we were about to go oh, on tour. Was there too? Alchemist came with me because we were about to go on tour. This is 1998. We're about to go on tour for the Smoking Grooves tour with P.E., uh, Wyclef with Praz and Cannabis, uh, Maya, Black Eyed Peas were, weren't even heard of yet. Mm. Uh, Gangstar, we brought Freddie Fox, which is Bumpy Knuckles. We brought Suge, M.O.P., and my man H Stacks from a group called Forbid. So that's down with our crew. And Buster brought the Flipboat Squad. Uh, Cypress Hill was there, and, and, he, and Alchemist was a roadie for, for Cypress Hill because he's part of Soul Assassins. Mm -hmm. So he's on the tour. So we were already getting ready to go on the road the next day. But the day before, Dilla's in there playing the drums. There's actually footage of, of Dilla if you YouTube it mm -hmm. with him playing the drums in Electric Lady. We're in the other room just hanging out watching him uh, mm -hmm. play and Quest Love was there because he had just tracked the drums to How Does It Feel mm. and and D'Angelo's trainer was there and D'Angelo goes, yo, Preem, my first video, I'm going to be naked in the video. I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah. I said, I said, well, I said, the girl's going to love that. He said, oh, yeah. He said, that's one of my trainers here. We're we getting, getting, getting them abs nice and crispy because he said, I got to be like sliced up when I do the video. <laughs> and even though he said he was doing it, it didn't really register until the video came out. Mm -hmm. And you could be male or female. You know when that video came on. Even if you want to say turn it off, that's too much. You, you checked it out. You know what I'm saying? And, and I remember that was the talk of the industry. The, every woman was like, yo, D'Angelo, D'Angelo. But I was there when Questlove was doing the boom. We were there. Wow, 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 yeah, wow. We were there, and Dilla was there laying drum stuff down too. That's Not dope. for that song, but just you know, just recording tracks and stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a picture of the four of us. Shot to Wajid. He's from Detroit. I don't know if you know Wajid, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, he he's from Detroit. He took the picture. Okay. Uh, he's actually making. Uh, being that I just moved, he had already made me Alchemist D'Angelo and. Uh, and one for Dilla's family, uh, the actual picture blown up oh, that's from dope. the natural from the actual camera. That's dope, man. When I was moving to my new house, dude, the move. I mean, I I, I had uh, 
what's the junk company uh, uh, that you just point and it disappears? Uh, junk lug. Well, I, I use junk luggers. That I said, Uh-oh. don't touch these because they rolled up in cylinders. Because uh, YG sent it to me to send one to D'Angelo and one to Alchemist and one for me to frame. Mm-hmm. They took the damn thing and threw it away. Wow. I just talked to YG maybe three days from the day we're shooting this. And he just told me, yo, I'm getting them made for you now to get you. Because oh, no. I told him, I. I got got to have that man, but uh, yeah, the 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 picture is a picture of me, Dilla, D'Angelo, and um, and Alchemist together because that was the session, mm-hmm. and and YG took that picture. So that's dope. I'm glad I have it. I'm glad we still have it because that's a memorable time. And like I said, you know, his trainer, me, Al, Dilla was there, and then there's another picture floating around. Shout to Dragon, which is uh. D'Angelo's engineer, there's another picture floating around with just me, Al, and Dilla, and you see me trying to pass him the blunt, so I'm doing like this, mm-hmm. and the smoke's coming out of my mouth, and Dilla's just kind of out to the side, and Alchemist leaning on the board, just looking. I'll show it to you when we're done, but, uh, Dope. and even if you need the pictures for this to incorporate, if we speak on it, you could, mm-hmm. you could, you could put that picture in there. Oh, dope, man. Yeah. Dope. Well, since we're speaking of Detroit, how did Prime come about with uh, Royce? Shout out to Royce, the yeah, 5'9", man. Nicole? Um, Prom uh, is a is a funny story because I got to shout out um, Kino and I got to shout out Mike Heron because they were working. You know, obviously Slaughterhouse was was working. Uh, there was some downtime and them finished it in their album on schedule. And uh, Mike was like, "Yo, maybe they could do something that's kind of not mixtape oriented, but sort of, where Premier does an EP." maybe five songs and those five songs would be from just one sound source so instead of me digging in the crates finding records to sample you would just do this guy that they, that mike was working with at the time named adrian young and so you only do adrian young's records to pull from but you make it into a premiere style beat it was supposed to be that first i was against it i didn't want to do it kind of put it on hold time passed Things weren't all together like it was originally planned. Royce hits me and says, yo, what if me and you still do that project? Would you do it? Mm -hmm. Now, Royce was just gotten off from being, uh, he was fighting alcoholism. He had just been sober. And I know the drinking Royce. So I'm so used to Royce drinking early in the day, all the way to the night, getting into trouble, doing a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. But when it came to getting in that booth, he's he's not, not playing no games. Yeah, Shouldn't think like this, but... I was uh, in L.A. <clears throat> on business, and I'm getting ready to fly back the next day. The day before, I had just met Joaquin Phoenix, the actor, because mm-hmm. he's a premiere fan. And um, shout out to my man John Abrams, who told me he wants to meet me because he knows I'm in L.A. He, we met. He, he and he was he. It was so dope because Joaquin was fanning out like, yo, when you did I right, Chill, now did you call these people or did you have a list or did you tell them you were going to do this? You know, and I like being able to answer those questions because he really wanted to know how did that uh, a skit like that come together. I was like, oh, no, I told them what I wanted to do. And each one, I told him, leave it on my voice machine. And he was like, wow, you know, so we got really cool. And I'll never forget, we're at this hotel. I forget the name of it. It's, he don't like a lot of light. He likes it real dark. <clears throat> we're sitting here and he goes, you see that big curtain right there behind you? I'm like, yeah. He said, uh, there's, there's somebody back there that says they know you. And, and mm-hmm. again, we're in a hotel chilling like in the, yeah. by the bar. And there's a big, <laughs> big old velvet red curtain and yeah. I'm still doing this. <laughs> you know, and because and, and, he's like, yeah, this person says they know you. And look, yeah. I just met him. Right. So, who, uh, you know, and I'm still kind of listening to him and doing this. I don't want to open and they jump out at me or something. Yeah. Do all this. <laughs> he said, this person that's behind the curtain said that they threw one of the dopest hip hop uh, events every week in New York back in the day. And we, we, we don't know if they're just, just, just jiving. Mm-hmm. I said, well, tell them to come out. Amanda Demi walks out. She used to, was married to Ted Demi, who started, who created Yo! MTV Raps. Mm-hmm. He passed away. Uh, God bless him. Um, 
she when she comes out, we do the, the big hug and everything. We were longtime friends. He says, yo, so did she really have a hot hip-hop club? I said, yeah, it was called Car Wash. It, it was like the spot mm -hmm. every Monday. And they're like, wow, she said she was like a big deal. I said, she was the only thing on Mondays. Everybody in the 90s came to her spot. And she would let people audition to rhyme. You see, you know, it, it was just a dope place at this club called Quando. Yeah. First time I ever met Buster Rhymes, all of them, everybody came there. They were the leaders. They were brand new then. Boom. She says, yeah, you know, I do artwork now, and uh, I, I'm a photographer. I do, like, really weird, bugged out, though. And she started showing me stuff on her phone. I'm like, whoa, that is kind of crazy. Yeah. She goes, you should let me do your uh, next next project. What are you working on? She said, me and Royce are doing a project. Um, so I said, I'll get back to you. I go back to my hotel room because we got to pack. We got to leave, like, 6 in the morning and catch our flight back to New York. I'm getting, uh, Joaquin and them are like, yo, there's a big party tonight, a uh, 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 Golden Globes after party is going to be popping. Yeah. All right, I'll go to the party. Right when I'm getting ready to go to the party and with, with, with my crew, Royce hits me and says, yo, I just recorded the first song. I want to see what you think, see if I still got it, because he's, yeah, he's sober now. Yeah. He might rhyme kind of corny, who different. knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sent it. I was like, I'll listen to it when I get back to the hotel. And I was like, nah, let me listen to it now. I hit play. Gather round, gather round. And I was like, oh, just that. Yeah. I was like, woo, he's back. <laughs> and then he goes, just another day in my reform. Like, he sounded like he, the way he, when he used to drink and just be really bargain. Yeah. Sober. I was like, yo, Royce, you back. Yeah. He goes, uh, that one's going to be called Prime. I said, all right, yeah, P-R-I-M-E. He said, no. Can I suggest when the record comes out, I don't want to say Royce the 5'9", DJ Premier. How about we call ourselves a group name? And I said, all right, what do you want to call it? He said, let's call it Prime. I said, all right, I like that. He said, no, but I don't want to spell it P-R-I-M-E. I want to spell it capital P, capital R. The P is for Premier, the R is for Royce, and then the H-Y-M-E is like for rhymes and everything else in hip hop. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's cool. So now we're prime now. Yeah, got it. Now I present that to um, to um, Amanda and tell her, and she ends up showing us these things where she could crack our faces into little pieces. And at first I was like, nah, that's not no hip hop. And then I was like, damn, it do look kind of ill though. Yeah, and look at the prime cover. She did that. And and that's all from meeting Joaquin Phoenix, mm -hmm. who's a dope actor. You know, he's a dope actor anyway. And then to uh, him to say that there's somebody behind the curtain, she ends up doing our cover, mm -hmm. and she did Prime 2 cover as well. So I, I told Royce, we're doing Prime 3 right now. I told him, uh, you know, uh, I, I have to tell you, you know, like first one was Adrian yes, Young. Sir. The first one was Adrian Young. The second one was Ant-Man Wanda. The third one, I have to tell you off record, who's the sound source, but uh, it's a big one. I appreciate so, that, so, man. Well, I'm going to let you go so you can work on that prime. I need <laughs> well, that prime three. I just three. came back from Detroit. I was out there for five days. I need that prime three. Yeah. I ain't going to hold you, man. I, I so I'm going to let you, I'm gonna let you go and work on that, man. <laughs> I appreciate you, my guy. Yes, I appreciate Ooh, you coming you over to my basement. Yes, sir.